Hello and welcome to Architecture Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with Ryan Scipione. He's a senior partner at MJMA Architects with offices in Portland and New York City. Scipione is a leader in the technical design, development, and management of the firm's residential, commercial, institutional, and hospitality construction projects. Although typically managing large-scale projects these days, he can still be found dangling from suspended scaffold high above the streets of Manhattan, guiding colleagues in a facade restoration project. Ooh, that would be intense. Or in the field stone cellar of an aging farmhouse, determining the viability of the existing structure. Our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design. Don't miss Scipione's design theory in the upcoming August issue of Maine Home Design. Thank you for coming into the studio today. Give it up for Ryan Scipione. Ryan Scipione, welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Thank you, you, for, thank you for having me, Trent. <laughs> You're welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. So to start out, what are you interested in these days aside from work? Um... <laughs> Well, I don't have a lot of free time as uh, as the no. uh, the current. Uh, you must be middle aged. <laughs> tone and timber dictates. Yes, I have two two daughters. Uh, they oh, wow. They um, take up the majority of the time right now, which is how old are they? Seven and eleven. Mm. Soon to be seven and twelve. Right. So, like, we just spent this past Labor Day weekend at a uh, soccer tournament in Epping, New Hampshire. Yep. Um, which was great. Good, good times staying at a hotel and soccer all day and night. And, um, <laughs> yep. How'd they do in the tournament? They did pretty well, actually. They, uh, they won all their games and then needed to win this win or tie the last game to go to the finals and they lost. Oh. So just, just shy. How'd they, of, of how'd they the deal? Final. How'd the team deal with defeat? Like lots of tears. <laughs> They're eleven and twelve year old girls. Oh, that's so hard. yes, it was it was a crushing blow, but that'd be hard as a parent. I would good imagine. for life. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean it, it's 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 fine. Um you know, some take it easier than others and um uh, you know, the real intense ones struggle a bit. Uh and the other uh more go with the flow types kind of help balance that out. So yeah, I, I got fine. one kid who, if he loses, boy, whoo, yeah. it's not good. And then yeah. the other one's like, well, they're on to the next thing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's amazing like, how personalities affect that response. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's, yeah, hmm. it's, it's fine. Like they'll, they'll be fine. They got to keep that. Like they, they got, a, they got a big game coming up. This, that same team is a big game coming up this weekend. They're actually playing in their league championships. They made it. To that because the tournament had nothing to do with what their soccer league is it's just like a tournament that happens every year um so they play on sunday somewhere up north of augusta man that must be a lot of driving to have your kids involved in sports. it is it is a lot of driving um <laughs> i was thinking that as i drove down here i was like i've been in the car a lot driving recently again. this past month and a half um so do you spread your time between manhattan and and maine uh, yes, but it's not an even spread. Um, I'm down in New York. Uh, it kind of varies depending on project load and in terms of like when I'm actually needed to see certain things and, and, and that piece. But like every other week, maybe I'm down there on average for mm -hmm. a day or two. Um, that's pretty much kind of the average. Uh, so, you know, that's good. But, um, I, when I go, I typically drive down because I have, you know, five or six site visits that I'm doing in a day or meetings. Uh, so I'm bouncing from place to place and need to be pretty mobile. Um, so I've, I've flown down before, but it's, um, you know, you're at the mercy of Uber and then Uber cab flights. Traffic, yeah. Uh, so it, it really is a lot more efficient to for me to drive so that just you know it's a bit of a bear for the the drive down and and back but you so know, it's doable what is your what what do your employers specifically use you for i'm i'm 
not having an, yep. necessarily a hard time understanding it, but to get it from the horse's mouth yep. to what you actually are doing. Yep. So, um, so I'm a, I'm a partner in my firm. Um, I'm actually the senior partner. Uh, we have a founding partner who founded our firm 40 some odd years ago, uh, Michael Macaluso. Um, he lives down in New York. Um, he mans the, the day to day down there. I do the same at our Portland office. And, um, so when I go, when I go down to New York, I'm typically just going to, uh, my projects or that I manage or sometimes, uh, projects that Michael or, uh, some of our other staff is managing that may need, uh, my expertise in, you know, whatever the issue may be, um, which uh, is typically um, detailing and uh, like construction systems. That is that is where I've uh, put a lot of my time and effort. Uh, into. So, are you, is your firm a specifically like uh, another firm would call you in to specifically focus on the detailing of larger scale product? projects um no not necessarily it's just what we do as part of our practice okay um we we're a generalist firm which there really aren't too many like that around it used to be more commonplace uh, mm -hmm. isn't so much so there's very little uh, discipline within the architectural realm that we don't do we don't get into some uh, specific institutional things um in the the healthcare sector and in the education sector but that's even hard to say these days because we've been um you know we've been we were uh, we do housework for fit down in um manhattan the fashion institute of technology um so we've been doing projects for them for quite a while um we do um uh, we actually work a lot with the ASPCA, so, you know, um, animal health care, and we do uh, doctor's offices through people we know that just want a custom, you know, office, um, so we'll do that. But the larger scale um, health care, you know, that's for the specialists for sure. We stay away from that. Um, so, you know, we, we do all sorts of, of practice uh, you know, residential, custom residential stuff from multifamily to single family, you know, that that's could be an apartment renovation somewhere, um, you know, custom home um, and, you know, a condo or co-op building as well. Um, we do all that stuff. We do hospitality, um, which is which is fun. Um, restaurants and bars. We do quite a bit of work on. Um, we've done a number of hotels that are you know typically the kind of boutique styling um, and, um, and and that's and then commercial work you know we do offices and, and that sort of thing um, so we kind of span the span the spectrum um, which is you know as I said not really the the um, the way so much anymore of other firms um, but we love it it keeps things really uh, dynamic and diverse it also requires a little bit extra effort to stay practiced with um, the various regulations and codes for those things. Mm -hmm. um, especially we have, you know, we practice in kind of two two areas. Uh, you know, the 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 New York tri-state area, and then you know from up here to Vermont, um, from Maine to Vermont. So, um, you know, we need to stay in tune with everything that is required, and uh, that is something that we you know, we do and, um, you know, we, we impress into our projects. So would you say that your, your specialty is in being a generalist firm in some sense? I'd say our specialty is, um, our specialty is really, uh, thoroughness on a given project. Um, we don't really ever take a project unless we are being retained for the construction administration portion so we can mm. see it through okay you know to its final c of o essentially um so you know from the moment of developing a program with a client of you know what do you want this to be like say it's a house like what do you want in the house you know where where's this happening right. um you know from that 
first written program, you know, to that last certificate of occupancy document, we are involved. I mean, there's a few exceptions to that rule mm -hmm. that we've just done, um, but as our standard practice, we do that. We provide, you know, almost all of the construction detailing um, and, you know, put that down in our drawings. So basically we can build this thing on paper uh, before it gets, you know, erected in, in the real world. Um, our clients have a much better sense of what the final product will be and, you know, tweaking things on paper is certainly a lot cheaper than moving built Changes walls. In the field and, yeah. Right. Um, so that, you know, is, is very helpful, uh, to our clients. Um, and they appreciate that, that piece. So, you know, thoroughness I'd say is literally our specialty and what we pride ourselves on. Um, and you know, that's definitely, um, what we teach our kind of up and coming interns and and um and architectural designers and so you the a principle that you hold within your firm is that you have a you have the ability to create and control the execution of the thing that you're tasked with creating that you not just kind of step in for the design portion and then see you later right right that's that's what we that's what we don't do really at all um you know, we are on board from start to finish, uh, you know, kind of uh, the full soup to nuts services. And, um, you know, that's, it's very beneficial on the ownership side. It's typically beneficial on the building side. Um, there's some contractors that, you know, they actually don't prefer that method. They, they want, once they have the general set of of plans to not have to deal with the designer. <laughs> Come right. on, get out of here. Um, and yeah. you know, it's, we all understand why that would be the case. It gives them some freedom to roam and, um, you know, create some uh, profit for themselves right. more Ad than would adjust the project. Either. Exactly. So that it can be most advantageous for them, which, you know, the, the goal is not to bury any one entity, you know, it's to be successful for everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's what we try to do. It's, it's, it's a fine balance of, um, maintaining your, your adversarial relationship with your contractor because you're the representative of the owner while, you know, being a reasonable, um, you know, arbiter of, uh, of, of any issue. Um, and it's important to kind of keep that in consideration so that, you know, things are fair when things are fair, they, that's when they go great, right. you know, and everybody's happy. Um, what's you know. the, uh, what's the most valuable skill set in making something like that work from your experience? Um, pr <laughs> probably reading, reading people. Um, mm. it's being more of a, you know, being a, being understanding the psychology of, um, those, interactions and people is incredibly important. Um, kind of anticipating where things could go based on certain decisions is, um, is really an incredibly valuable tool and often, you know, can, can steer a project from heading down the black hole to, you know, being very successful. Right. Um, you know, so that's, that's super important. And that's, you know, that's something that's always been said in architecture, you know, the, the psychology of the, of the client, um, and, you know, is, is, is incredibly important when designing something for them, an office space, a home, um, you know, whatnot, how, you know, not just what they want, like, you know, I want, I want a game room, I want a big kitchen, like, that's wonderful, you know, but like, you know, you want to, you want to understand what do they do when they first wake up in the morning? Um, you know, they sit in bed and read for a while. Do they immediately get up, make coffee? Um, you know, do they like to go outside, sit and read. Like, what are they, do they go work out, you know, and, and you can kind of sculpt, um, you know, people's surroundings based on, you know, their, their kind of true inner workings and that part's, you know, pretty cool. So, um, you know, the psychology of it all is, is, 
is pretty amazing. And when you pair that with the incredible amount of, um, technology that we have these days, it's like, it's, it's just amazing what you can do. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's very cool. It's very cool to, to kind of be the, the crafter of that puzzle. Right. Right. Um, and that's what, what's, you know, pretty exciting. Now, what part of relationship management in executing a successful project, which part of relationship management typically takes the most intellectual horsepower to manage and why? Mm -hmm. um, certainly the, <laughs> certainly the, the, um, the, the, the maintaining of, of, um, of the fairness and happiness of the two main parties, which are, you know, the builder and the owner, um, maintaining that balance is by far the greatest effort. Um, you, you are heading into it knowing what the final product wants to be. Um, that's pretty set. Uh, and there are adjustments along the way, whether they're driven by, you know, financial, um, constraints or, um, you know, environmental issues, whatever the case may be. Um, so the, the ability to blend, um, those, those two, uh, sides between those two parties is definitely the most difficult, um, creates the most amount of frustration in a project. Um, and, you know, is by far the kind of most general, um, consistent, factor that is you know a difficult a difficulty in the in that project process so would that be you as the designer uh doing your best to manage the uh, relationship and expectations between the owner and contractor yep absolutely um and it it it, it very much is that um you know as it, i think it's it's been said many many times that an architect um you know also acts as as a counselor to these parties. Um, okay. and it's in that, you know, it, it's in that regard where it really kind of shines through that. Like, yeah, you, you need to, you're moderating these two parties with, you know, still keeping, um, you know, your eyes on the prize as to, you know, where this needs to go. So, um, yeah, it, it, it is, it is, that is the most, um, the most required effort and it, and it's, it can be exhausting. Um, oh yeah. you, know, you talk to anyone, you know, and, and you see it most in, um, in, um, you know, certain, uh, residential projects will, will, this will be, uh, prominent. Um, and then, uh, projects when you're have a board, um, where it's multiple entities, um, kind of, of a, you know, similar, um, mindset, but they have different finite decisions, um, that you need to wrangle together and kind of direct. And then a little more designed by committee at some point. Yeah. In that sense. Uh, yes, yes, certainly. <laughs> so, um, it, it seems like from an outside perspective, having never, truly gone through the, I, I went to school for architecture and practice for a few years, but I never got to the point where I was actually managing anything worth, uh, categorizing as experience. Right. right. Um, but it seems like from the outside that the, the architect comes in and creates a solution for the program that the owner submits to the architect. They create a, a vision and a solution that they then have to protect and guide the contractor in building. And the contractor will have an embodied desire to reduce the cost of production of the thing that they agreed to produce. And it would seem like the main static, if, if I were in your position, would be protecting the integrity of the design between the architect and contractor while shielding the conflict of that relationship while, while shielding the owner from having to know anything about that, the owner really comes, they've signed off on the design. Now the owner says, here's the design and we already have an agreed upon budget 
to a degree. And then you kind of say, yeah, all right, you enjoy yourself over there and we're going to fight yeah. <laughs> to try and get to the best spot. But by the end of it, it seems like a lot of times the contractor and the owner are on good terms and the architect is on the outs. Yeah, I, and I see that, um, I see that m m more with the... Um, I see that more up here than I do in any other area, frankly. Is it because um, of residential, you think, more than commercial? I mean, it's and it, and it seems to be the case on these residential projects, for sure, more so. Um, you know, the contractor will say, okay, I can, you know, I can do this cheaper. Yeah. And it'll be like this, and, and that's fine. Um, you know, and just often the case with that is there's certain things that aren't considered. They're typically longevity items um, that you know, the professional has considered in design, whether it's an engineer or an architect, you know, the use of certain materials that they know, you know, this won't deflect over, you know, this many decades, it's going to be great, you know, contractor right. will sub something in that, you know, may and then the residual, um, you know, impacts start to unfold. Um, so like, yes, um, I, I, I see that. Um, you know the the documents, the document, the drawings that the the architect creates and that the um, the owner agrees agrees to and and is set. Um, you know they are they are static, but they there should never a contractor can often come in with a better solution to. Um, to getting the end result accomplished. Um, mm. Like the, like shop drawings are like an awesome example of that, like in any industry, you know, like for industrial design or whatnot, like this is what we want to have happen. Um, how do we get it made? Uh, you know, shop drawings are produced and, you know, someone may have been thinking, okay, I'll, you know, I want this, you know, titanium robot to, you know, do this and this, and this is how it should go together. And, you know, the, the builders of this come together and say, okay, like we can, um, you know, we can actually do this. We can give the, the titanium shell, but where you have all these pieces overlapping, you know, we don't need to actually do that in titanium. It can be done in, you know, whatnot, just as uh, in, in aluminum as an example. And, um, and, you know, they're like, no, we want it. The designer says, no, we want it to be, you know, this way, but it, it, in reality, it doesn't have to be. So, you know, uh, a, a good a good designer will understand that those adjustments um, you know can happen do happen need to happen to make things right. be all right um, so you know there's a level of you know reasonability and understanding that is like really important in those situations for the professional to have to make things run smoothly because it's when that that isn't in place that you get that separation right you know between the owner and architect or between the architect and contractor that um you know usually ends in a in a turmoil of a situation a party um, but you know that it, it's it that it's rare um but it happens um you know, we're I, I'm seeing things right now where s there's contractors, you know, who don't, like I said, don't want to continue on with the architect because they've had poor experiences with a professional in the past. Yeah. You know, um, you know, maybe the full full due diligence wasn't done, and you know, not everything was properly conforming to zoning, and they got burned, and you know, now they have this, now they have this, um, you know, this this tombstone, um, that is, uh, you know, etched with this issue and, you know, it's hard to bring them back, but, um, but it, you know, it can be done when, when working with the right people, these, these situations do not take that difficult path. Um, and that's just, it's important to recognize it like as it's unfolding and, right. you know, that plays into just, you know, being, being a bit of a psychologist, um, you know, while you're working on these projects right. is a requirement. Yeah. I, from talking to some of my existing clients, the 
the relationship between designer and builder is extremely important with especially the residential designers and builders because the architect will design something in concept, but the ability to have it constructed, the process of getting this piece there while fastening it is impossible how they yep. designed it or something sure. else, right? Right. And the really good designers will, or the builders will understand, they just get it, that like this is what they're trying to achieve. Right. I can find a way to do the exact same design intent achievement yep. while building it maybe a little bit different so it's actually buildable. Sure. Yep. And those guys can like with a phone call run it by, get it approved and it's like no loss of time. Right. No loss of money, you know, relatively. Yep. Yep. No, and no change, yep. Yeah, those those builders are the ones that I found the really high end um designers gravitate towards oh, because it's just like painless yep. in the field and they're just great to work with and absolutely. they have this yep. designer quality of care uh in what they're creating yeah as the designer does that that's really um that makes those specific builders really valuable yep and, th and they have the they have the skill of being able to see you know what the intent is of the final design so you know you're not you're not changing that um you know, you just may be changing things that you you can't see so that it produces what the intent was. Right. So exactly like, the, I mean, those those are, you know, those are the gems um, of the building community. And, you know, it's great. I mean, it's a, they're the, the true craftsmen that, yeah. you know, they they understand how it can get put together. And, you know, it's even that process is even easier when you have, you know, designers that understand how things can get put together so they're not putting you know um they're not putting situations where you can't fit a drill in to screw in you know right. the two pieces together um you know recognizing that in the drawing process is incredibly important um you know so then you avoid that you can you literally understand what the contractor you know would be understanding um, and you know, you can make those adjustments before it even gets finalized on paper. Um, and that, you know, that makes a good designer, um, you know, whether it's an engineer, architect, w whatever it happens to be. So did you always know that you wanted to be an architect? And once you became an architect, did it live up to what you thought it would be? Mm -hmm. Um, did I always know I wanted to be an architect? Uh, so the accurate answer to that question is no, but I did always know that I wanted to go into the architecture and engineering field. Um, I like always, I mean, you know, from, from when I was little playing with Legos, which is like right. everybody's, you know, it's interesting. That my story. oldest son like loves yeah. Legos. Yeah. Youngest one like puts a couple together. And he's like, yeah, I need to go play. Right, like, right, right, yeah. right, right. The physical, yeah. Um, so like you know, doing that was always great. And then um, you know, when I was younger in the '80s, there was a big wave of robotics toys. Um, Did you ever have Capsella? I did have Capsella. Did you, I got to play with those? And you like those so cool. They had the yellow like little ball outriggers, and you yep. could make boats to play with in the yep. tub and yep. stuff. Um, Loved those. And I was trying. I was like the other day. I was actually trying to remember this one like line of toy, and I want to say it was robotics or something to that effect. Like an erector set type of thing. It it, it was, but it wasn't um, similar. They were. It was all plastic, and they were. There was gray like shaped plastic pieces and how they fit together was they had male and female octagonal pieces. Mm -hmm. And so you could fit them together at, um, you know, at different angles. Right. And then there were motors that all fit to these universal fittings. So you could, you could build things from like a dog that could walk to, and you, you know, one right. set had, you know, directions for two or three things for you to build. Right. Um, right. And it was great. And you could, and you could build those things and then you could build other things. Um, and, uh, I remember the first one I got, it was awesome. And I didn't even look at the directions and it was, a you could build like a dinosaur or something. And I built the dinosaur and I went to turn it on 
and it just started walking backwards because I built, I just, I didn't look at the directions. Switched I built wires. it exactly like the pictures showed, but I actually had reversed like the motors. So all it, all it just walked backwards instead of forwards, but it right. was, it was pretty awesome. But the thing um, I liked about Capsule is they had like the gears going through them yep. so you could connect them and then they'd have a differential one. And yep. Those are so cool. They were very cool. I, you know, that stuff's like amazing. Um, you know, so I would always play with that as a kid and, um, you know, and then as I got older in high school, we had kind of a pre-engineering program and I did that um, and, you know, loved it still and and knew, OK, I definitely wanted to to head in this direction. Uh, and I thought that direction was mechanical engineering. So I went off to be a mechanical engineer, um, which uh, which my first year of because you when you do that, you have to leave college knowing what your major is going to be, which, you know, was not like most of my friends. Um, you know, some of them were in the same kind of field, so they did the same at other schools. But uh, so you head off to be an engineer and, you know, halfway through the year of doing 23 pages of problem sets a night and like very little creative, um, uh, you know, study whatsoever. I just I realized that the engineering direction was probably not correct and that I needed to to turn to more of the architectural where there could be a little bit more creativity involved on the a little bit um, more subjective direction to the design rather than everything has a right and wrong right at every turn right, right? you have to mathematically decide yep yep yeah. exactly so I mean that's how I ultimately ended up you know zeroing in on architecture um and you know it was it was definitely worth it at least for me because the you know the study that you do in engineering um is is great and um i you know i translate that to the architecture work that i do um you know we as a firm and me specifically do um you know if the project isn't isn't a large scale one, you know, we do all of our engineering in house, um, you know, as architects, you know, doing the structural engineering mechanical. Um, so, you know, you guys do all of your own engineering. We do for, oh. you know, unless, unless we're building, you know, a 27 story hotel, um, yeah. you yeah. know, then we have our team of consultants. Um, so do you, know, you have an engineer on staff or so? Okay. No, we so, don't. Cause I remember going through architecture school thinking like, okay, they've trained us. I can do this, yep. but boy, I'd rather have someone else stamp yep. it. Cause sure. <laughs> yep. But and, you guys are capable and do that. We, so we do, um, you know, so we'll do for, you know, smaller projects. We'll, you know, we'll do all the structural analysis and, um, and sizing and plans, um, and it's it's exactly that you are given the tools to know how to do it in the beginning, and it's just a matter of if you practice them or not. Right. Um, and we, as a as a firm, and you know, the founding partner, myself, um, you know, we try to to bring our our younger staff into that into that fold and practice as well. Um, because of anything, it gives you a better understanding of what your engineers are doing. Right. Um, and, you know, because everybody either makes mistakes or um, misses the direction. So it's just it, it gives you, you know, gives you more in your quiver to be able to, you know, speak appropriately to it and, you know, kind of step in if need be. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, absolutely. That is. Now, do you guys model your buildings in 3D, like so you can do everything, yeah. uh, fly through it, know where everything is, basically? Yeah, we do. We, we do for the most part. Not every project. Um, it's more. It's more dictated by what we think the client needs to see. You know, bigger projects, absolutely. It's almost always done. Um, you know, smaller homes. Um, if the elevations and, you know, interior uh, and exterior elevations um, and sections, you know, aren't getting the job done as, as far as conveying spatially to the client, like, right. yes, we'll, 
will absolutely just, you know, bang out a quick 3D and it's, um, you know, it's a great tool. And with the, you know, with the tech that is available now, it's easier than ever. So that's not a big deal. Um, you know, there's, we have, we have a couple consultants that if we need a super realistic photo rendering, we go to, and they can produce that. And it's crazy what they look like now. Yeah. Um, it kind of makes me feel like I'm going to be out of a job soon. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, un it's, it's unbelievable. I think uh, there's something, my, my thought of job security at this point is that sure we can render perfection and the lighting and everything, but that level of perfection, there's something in the perfection that is a, that is a lie mm -hmm. that the, the person, the person viewing knows that okay so you pushed a button and we're right. able to render it i want to see what you actually completed yeah. yeah and there's something in the the imperfection that tells you of its truth and that you actually accomplished it that there's something in that right. that like if you don't have someone photograph it or even if you don't take a horrible photograph and show like no it really right. happened yeah yeah you know and yeah. it's instead of just theory it, sure like Yep. Here's the level of reality that we were able to achieve in relation to the perfection of the ideas of the design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, photograph holds, it, you know, it holds a weight that a rendering could never, ever yeah. could. Um, so, you know, I, that that will always be the case um, as far as, but it's so, but I mean, it's very true. Like you look at these perfect renderings and you're like, wow, that's absolutely amazing. And gorgeous. How, and... How, yeah, how can that be? Right. Um, so, but it's, it's just, it's super, it's super interesting what you can do now. And, you know, even, even the more simple renderings, like how far they've come, um, you know, the renderings that can be done so quickly are the ones that would take, you know, days and weeks to do. Oh, in school, I'd, uh. I'd on a weekend on Friday, I'd hit render and like, hopefully I'd I check remember, it on Saturday and be like, uh, not yeah, yet. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember doing that, you know, in the office a couple of decades ago you, you would yeah, leave it over the weekend yeah it still wouldn't be done yeah and then towards the end like for some reason power blip or crash and you're just like, oh. yeah all is lost oh, all is lost yeah it's, it's crazy <laughs> it, it's it's crazy what you can do now it's so really the uh construction uh no wait contract documents mm -hmm. to get the term correct mm -hmm. between new york and here yeah like is there a cultural difference between the two states that is reflected in the documentation required to build build something? These yeah, days? I mean, there is in so much as um, like up around the New England area, um, builders tend to not want or think they need the level of documentation that a firm may produce in, you know, like the New York City, Chicago area. Um, and you know that that may be the case uh it 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 may be the case if the builder's a craftsman and um you know they can they can produce the intent um but if there are specific things which there often are that that want to be implemented um you know drawing those details calling out those specifics you know this is what i want for you know, this piece of, of trim that overlaps this, where the materials, you know, are tucked under here. Um, you know, you can't, you can't really beat that. Um, and that's why it's drawn. Um, you know, the biggest issue I see is not so much in, in the drawing piece, like often good builders are appreciative of the detailed amount of drawings. Um, I know up here when we do um, houses and homes, uh, you know, as part of um, as part of our our typical services, we would, you know, we'll do a reflected ceiling plan with a lighting layout. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll want to go over that with the client. I mean, lighting is incredibly important, as you know, um, for any space. So, you know, to leave that off uh, of a design is, you know, it's a it's it's a little, it's a little sad. Um, That's why my dining room light is not over the table. <laughs> right. Now I have to come up with a thing, uh, like a, I think I'm going to just fabricate a light and it'll have two points of 
you know, connection. Yep. And so that way, you know, I can just run over to right now. It's like a single light that's over here in the dining rooms there. Right, so right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, it so, wasn't, exactly. it, yeah. it wasn't that, I mean, we, we paid as little as we could for design documents mm -hmm. because I have a background in design, mm -hmm. but you know, all those things became evident that like I right. had a, I had an education in it, yep. but if you don't practice, you're right. going to miss yeah. so much. Yeah, exactly. And I um, did, yeah, but, right. but we also, we reined in like, all right, don't give us an electrical plan. I'll do it. Yep. And you know, but I didn't do a reflected ceiling plan. So they didn't know quite where to put the in. So it ended up, you know, yeah. And, but they, they did to the nth degree, as far as like the, the, um, the sealedness of the building and the, sure how everything went together and they did an incredible job. But I did find like the, our design documents, our contract documents were very, very specific. Like this kind of caulking here at the, yep. at the sill and blah, blah, blah. And, and all of that. And, uh, our foundation at certain parts of our house were only like a foot off of complete slab. Like okay. we were, we wow. were on yeah. a, we built on a huge plate of just granite Yep, Sweet. and it's, and it's like, you know, perfect. But at the same time, you know, our, our documents called for, I think every six feet or something drilled, epoxied, rebar, howl it in. Yep. you know, yep. and every, all the guys were just, oh, you don't need to do that. This stands up for trial. You don't need to do this. You're not, you don't need to do that. Like it's just constant. Yeah. Like you don't yeah. need to do that. You yeah. don't need to do that. Yeah. And we just had to insist like, yep. well, you agreed you need to do it. Right. And so they do like half of it. And they wouldn't like epoxy the rebar. They just hammered, you know, like all this stuff. Yep. yep. And it, but I mean, we were our own general contractor too. Okay. Yep. And we were trying to save money. And so sure. there's always this battle. Yep. And yep. yeah, so I, I think when you get the right contractor, it it's just like you could almost give them elevations, section, and floor sure. plan and yep. just say, yep to the owner, you're gonna have the best house ever the less we intervene from right. here on yep. with some contractors, that's yes. just incredible, yep. but you are going to pay through the nose yes, for those are. guys because yep. they're so valuable. Right, and now you're gonna wait like a couple of years oh, yeah. uh, for yeah. them to be available. And yeah, I mean, that's absolutely, uh, you know, the, and yes, as like we were saying before, you know, these these gem builders are amazing and, um, and wonderful and just not everybody has access to them. Right. So it's like, and in fact, most don't have access to them. So when you don't like, what do you do? Um, you know, so, you know, documentation is your, is your savior in that, right. in that piece. And then all you need to do is enforce that documentation, which, you know, you need to do, um, with a fairness and, um, you know, with a reasonableness, but yeah, I mean, it's, like, like you were saying about, you know, doing the layouts and whatnot yourselves and how, you know, you're like, oh, I learned this and now I see, you know, how it, how it pertains. I mean, yeah, it's it, it like, I, I love that stuff when you, you know, watch the lesson or the drawing become a reality. Um, you know, you see those, you see those diagrams all the time of, uh, of, you know, a, a, a person, a sketch person standing at a countertop of a kitchen and the lighting overhead and what happens, you know, when the light moves, um, a foot in one direction, six inches in another and how, you know, it casts the shadow on, you know, what, you know, the cucumber that you're chopping up and, right. you know, how important it is to, you know, get the lighting in the right position to make that space illuminated and, you know, is, is, is as proper as it should be. Um, so, you know, it's, it's things like that where, you know, designers who, you know, understand can put that down on paper, indicate the distance, you know, from your vertical cabinets and then your lighting in, in your kitchen is, is, is right. I mean, it's good. Right. Um, and it makes a, makes a big difference. Um, so, you know, and that's what, that's what we try to do. I mean, and that's what, you know, most try to do and it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's great to practice. Um, so like those documents, um, like I was saying, the builders, they're like happy to see. They're like, oh, great. We have a lighting layout. We don't have to guess. you know, sit here, right, either guess or, you know, right. get the client in and be like, where do you want this? Because all of that is resolved. Um, right, right. So, you know, the, and there may be a, an adjustment here to, you know, certain pendant fixtures or whatnot. Maybe not at all. But that 
the amount of adjustment, the amount of field changes is so greatly reduced. Um, you know, the builders can just move the schedule, you know, goes quickly and, and, um, you know, it's, it's just a great benefit to both parties. So, you know, from what I've seen, yeah, builders, they love more drawings, um, you know, details, uh, there may be a tweak based on their experience. Uh, you know, often it's for the better. They're the builders. They're the ones that are, you know, hammering the nails every day. And right. they, they, um, you know, they have that experience. So, you know, it's good to hear what they have to say on that piece. Um, you know, in, in general, the builders don't like as much of the written documentation in terms of, you know, the contracts, um, the, you know, warranty requirements, all that piece. It, it's, it's, you know, still very important. Um, you know, a, a good builder will, will, you know, go through and, and, you know, they'll use that stuff. That'll be fine. Um, and certainly if people are in a situation where they, you know, they don't have a, a gem builder, they have a good builder, um, you know, and their documentation, their plans are light, um, you know, contracts can be incredibly important. Um, they can, you know, really save, you know, people's lives and, um, you know, people's well beings. Yeah. The, uh, the, the horror story from architecture school with the tie rods of the sky bridge Yeah, that they, Oh, we don't need a whole tie rod there. We'll just put that big connector in the middle and mm -hmm. then 300 people die and the yep. architect kills himself. Yep. That's like the one that everyone gets in their head planted yep. in there. Like follow, follow what it says. So it's not your fault. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Um, and you know, with this whole industry, there's just, I mean, to that end, there's just, you know, there's an incredible amount of liability that are assumed by, you know, the owner, the professional, the builder, um, you know, so no one, no one really wants to mess around with that uh, mm. if they don't have to, and they shouldn't. Um, it seems know. like the the pushback from a contractor, uh, from my experience, usually comes where they're asking, they're being asked to do something that they typically do in this way, mm -hmm. but they're asked to do the same thing, but do it in a very different way. Yep. There's, there's like, okay, but there's going to be a significant upcharge, or right. if you're not involved, the contractor is going to say. We'll, we'll accomplish the same thing, but we'll do it this way. Yep. That's where there's some pushback comes back. But then the appreciation is in when it's clearly drawn and they don't have to think about it. They can just say that's from here to here. Great. We'll put it there to there right. or locate it here. So like I've, I've started working on my wife's car just as like a new th hobby to do in right. life. Okay. Uh, yep. Just to maintain it. Yeah. Uh, just because I can send it off and have someone else do it. But there's something about mechanical repair that yep. there's only right and wrong right. that is kind of um, kind of calming for me. Sure. I don't have to have a subjective yeah. opinion in it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and the thing I found is like the use of YouTube, like instead of me like, well, maybe this goes here and right. how's this and maybe, yeah. it takes like five hours for a one hour job. Mm -hmm. But if you watch a YouTube video on right. the exact thing, yep. you're like, oh, that's what I do. Yeah. And then you just go and do it and you have a very nice experience. Absolutely. So I got to imagine yeah. as and a it, contractor, I mean, it, it'd it, be a similar thing. It, yes. Um, I mean, very much so. And like, I mean, I do the same thing, um, for cars, for, um, bikes. Like I've been, you know, building my own bicycles for a while now. Um, and oh, cool. you know, YouTube has been a, a wonderful resource and just the, the quantity of video, the population of it has yeah. just exploded. So, you know, if you need to figure out how do I, how do I replace the element on my, you know, on my old stove, there's likely a YouTube video yeah. for like that exact stove, if not within the same model family where someone is showing you right. how to, you know, take the back off, um, you know, pull out the, the, um, the heating element, replace it and, like, it's just, it's amazing. Like, oh, it, I love it, is, it. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's awesome. Um, and I, I, I spend a lot of time figuring things out that way for, you know, things that I am finding myself needing to repair, which is exponentially growing these days. Um, yeah, right there with you. So it's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, on on the contracting uh, side, when when they have that um, knowledge and understanding of the desired final result from the drawings um, and the assembly of it in relation to what's drawn, like it's, it's amazing. Uh, when they don't and you're getting something that looks like it, but has, uh, you know, a number of questionable assembly components, you know, then, then it's an issue. Um, mm. that's not, you know, that's certainly in, in my experience, not, you know, not commonplace, but it does happen. So, you know, to be, to be on your toes and observant during the construction process is, you know, pretty paramount for an owner, um, you know, the, the designer, uh, whoever you've, you know, representative, whoever, you know, right. whoever's, you know, being tasked with the responsibility to do that as there should always be someone doing that, you know, even if it's just owner and contractor, um, you know, the owner, they are then tasked with doing that. And that's, you know, that is a job in and of itself, which a lot don't realize and they find out pretty quickly. So the thing I would have to imagine is the absolute hardest part of your job were I to be doing it would be the site visit where someone's done something wrong and it's going to be a conflict. Yeah. How do you handle that? And how do you sleep at night after a con a conflict like yeah. that? Yeah. Um, yes, that is definitely difficult. And um, it's certainly harder for certain personalities as that um, exposing person. Um, for me personally, with experience, it has become much easier. And frankly, I don't have any problems with it whatsoever. So, now. so how did you get there? Um, like, what was the difficulty at first? And how did you learn how to become not quite so rattled yep, by it and yep. able to do it's, it effectively? I mean, it's just, you know, it's, um, it's a factor of being, um, of having the knowledge to be confident in, in, um, making that exposure and that call. Um, you know, usually on the, uh, the, you know, the, um, the folks on the greener side of experience, um, you know, it's very difficult for them. They're, they're, you know, either younger, if they're not young, they're just, they're, they're inexperienced, they're timid. Um, they are, it's a, you know, it's a shyness from the conflict. Hmm. Um, and just, the fact that if it's not addressed will only get worse mm. understanding that piece um makes you realize if it's not nipped in the bud now this it's going to go downhill fast because this will either spread or this issue will have residual effects um you know, and more and under similar decisions would be made outside of yep. the lines of where you were directing. Right. This. And, you know, I mean, that's kind of like the setting of the tone. Um, that's great. Like if everything's going swimmingly well in a project um, and, you know, one thing pops up, you know, three quarters of the way through, like, you know, it, it and you've been monitoring it along like it's you know, it's not an issue. It'll need to be corrected. But um, but certainly when you, you know, roll up to say a, you know, a home project and they're starting to frame the walls and, you know, where you've called for, you know, two by eight framing because you wanted to get additional insulation um, and they're using That's two by six one. insulation. Yep. Uh, yeah, they're using two by sixes. You know, you gotta, you gotta call that they're like, oh, we always frame everything with two by sixes. Like, oh, I understand. And, you know, that's, that's pretty normal, but this isn't, the intent is for this not to be that normal. Um, you know, this is, we're doing this for this reason. And just the explaining to, you know, the builder, contractor, um, consultant, the reasons why is, is usually very helpful. They right. typically will be like, oh, okay. I wasn't even thinking about that. I get it now. And, you know, then it sets up, um, you know, a, an agreeable, 
um, resolve to it and the relationship is maintained, um, you know, and things can move forward, you know, still on that, that good path. Right. Uh, have, have you had situations where something, a mistake that gross was made where two by eight rather than two by six for framing was going on? Like, yeah, we, I've encountered <laughs> several situations where, you know, that has been done. Um, usually, uh, it is, you know, just a direct nonconformance with the documents. Right. So it's, it's a situation where you like see this, that's just two by eight. Right. This is what we expect. You're going to have to. Yep. And, um, and it's, you know, it, 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 it's always been addressed in the experiences that I've had. And, you know, there may be more chagrin on the contractor side than, than not. Sometimes there isn't, um, you know, I had, I had a, a project very recently that was done where, um, we were replacing um, cast stone coins that uh, coins coins is um, it's like they're they're the the stone blocks that kind of frame the corners of masonry buildings. Okay, that yep. alternate oh, coining, as you, coin, right? Yeah, got as it. You go out, so, so each yep. individual is a coin, um, and we were doing so on um, on a on a building. Um, contractor got samples in as the documents required. We reviewed the samples. Looks great. Um, and then they got the load, the shipment load in of, of these replacement stones, started to put them in and the color was not the same. It was slightly off, you know, if it needed to be, um, you know, a, um, a, a, a certain tone of, of gray, um, it, it was that tone with just a tiny bit of cream in it, but was not correct. It, it's those, it's those issues where the, it's not a, it's a subjective it's not issue like, in oh, a this way. is a two by six versus a two by eight. Um, mm. you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not as easy to resolve. It's not an objective problem with the perception of color is actually subjective. Right. And so then you run into like, well, you approved it. Like, yep. Yep. So I mean, exactly. And that, I mean, and that's the, and those are the most difficult ones. Um, you know, there's been a, you know, there's a, a mixed design submitted to create these, these cast stone units. Um, you know, there's a specific pigment spec, all that's reviewed, approved this, you know, physical samples produced great. Um, you know, the specific issue with this one was that all of that was done to the approved specifications. Yeah. Um, it was produced and they didn't properly wash out the um, machines that were done to make the mix in the factory mm. um, from a previous, you know, set for another project. Um, it had some pigment still stuck to the, you know, walls and whatnot of these, you know, massive machines that produce the, the, um, the mixture that they cast these stones out of. Uh, and that was the issue. And, you know, fortunately this one ended up where the, the plant that produced them said, yes, this was the problem. Yes, this was our fault. Um, you know, all, all went well, but you know, it ends up, it delayed the project by quite a bit. Um, but you know, it wasn't the contractor's fault. It wasn't the owner's fault. It wasn't yeah. the designer's fault. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that happened. And, you know, the contractor was, uh, you know, pretty annoyed that they then had to take, you know, their new work out that they had just put in. Um, but they did so, you know, to their credit, um, we're in actually that very good about it. Who, who eats the profit? It, was it the manufacturer of the block essentially? And so, so typically how it would go is, um, the contractor would say, it's not my fault. I cannot pay for this. Right. And they're right. Yep. Um, so in order to get, keep things moving, the owner would pay for it. Then it would just become a, an issue where of the owner then needing to chase this, this plant in this case that produced this. Um, uh. what happened here is thankfully the contractor didn't get too far. So he's like, I'll just take it out 
it'll be a lot easier, I'll make things go faster. So he took the stones out, you know, put it, uh, you know, on his own dime. Um, and, you know, was a, was one of those good contractors that just does that, understands like it's to demo these out. It's only going to take this amount of time. I'm just going to do it and we'll move forward and right. we'll keep everyone happy. And that will pay dividends, you know, throughout this project. And, you know, usually that's the case. Now, how would, for someone um, as cheap as me, yeah, <laughs> trying to select as, uh, a contractor. You mean as uh, financially responsible? Right. Yes. Uh, wait, what, what's my wife call it? She calls it uh, thrifty <laughs> at times. But yeah, yeah, yeah. so we, we built our house. My wife managed the construction of it. Our main contractor, Noah Wentworth, like we did not have to worry about anything if he was working on it. Nice. Like yep. he yep. was incredible. Right. Yep. Now, when the concrete guys come in or like plumber associated, we had a little bit more. So we, it was on us to management. We weren't paying him to manage it. Okay. So my wife, she's good with conflict resolution and contractors can't really lose it on a woman like they can on a man. And I'm not very confrontational and I'm difficult and I'm opinionated. So yeah, it would yeah, get really right. weird really yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, sweetie, you're great at this. You should manage yeah. it, you know, cause nice. we'll get a better end result. Yep. She, she's great at it smart yep now when it came to building the barn like right next to our house she was like how about you do it and so i went and put out all the bids to you know i i designed it as much as i thought you'd actually have to because it's just a barn with no insulation wind can kind of blow through it it's no big deal detailed it aesthetically but not technically at all um and then submitted got three estimates and went with the middle one. I just decided ahead of time, that's what I'll do. Turns out the middle one was actually the low ball and the lowest one just had no business building anything. Showed up in a rented small compact car, like no truck with ladder or any sign, nothing, you know. So it was my fault. And we get into building this thing and the contractor eventually, he had some lines that were just kind of like, I. he was good like with these lines, but the the concrete guys when they poured the foundation i was like hey any leftover you have just put it in because a little bit higher on the concrete wall is going to be only to benefit so mm -hmm. don't don't dump it somewhere just yep. put it all in right right yep. yep and they're like yeah okay sure and even so i think they had like a tiny bit left over that they dumped that my kids made a bike jump out of nice. so now we have a concrete bike jump excellent which is cool um and then after that, he came back to me and said, yeah, since you asked the, you know, them to put in extra, you know, they're charging me four grand more or something. And I was, at the moment, my, my head just exploded inside and was like, I knew this was going to happen because I had a big, long written contract yep. because I don't deal well with managing relationships yep. uh, outside of like knowing where things are going to be because right. my emotion towards money comes in and yep. I'm like, ah, you know, yeah. And so I just in that moment, I was just like, I didn't know what to say. I was like, I, I'm really uncomfortable right now. And I don't know what to say. I'm going to have to get back to you. And mm -hmm. I just walked away. Yeah. <laughs> and I could tell under me is like, that is not what I expected to happen. Right, there. Right, you know, right. I, I didn't really have a good comeback. And I realized later what I should have said. I was like, I am so sorry they're doing that to you. Right. Uh, give me the bill and I'll pay it directly. I'll talk to them. Mm hmm. Because there was no, in my opinion, no communication between the concrete guy and this guy. Yeah. But he yeah. kind of knew them. And when I said, like, I remember saying something to that effect. And he was like, oh, no, blah, 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 you know. And it was just became more and more obvious. Yeah. That he was definitely giving us the runaround to get more money out of it. And he might have underbid it and was hurting and just sure. trying to, you know. Yep. Um, and then what was the other one? There is this other really obvious one where they measured the opening for the door off the top of the concrete rather than the cutout for the concrete. Yep. So it ended up being a two foot wide, eight foot tall door. Wow. Rather than a six foot eight, you know? Right. And my wife, both my wife and I are like, hey, what's going on with this door being so tall? He's like, oh, that's a standard eight foot door. Just kept on moving just like that, you know? Both of us looked at each other like, all right, there's no getting right. through this. You right. know, it's yeah. all right. Nice. But like, how do smooth, you try to smooth it out? Sure. Yeah, that's standard yeah. eight foot door. Right. Really, eight <laughs> feet. Didn't know that was standard. <laughs> so, uh, like, yeah. how do you in in that range? What would be some like guidance for people who are having to do it themselves to say like what to look out for and and search for in a contractor? Yeah. Um, so just, uh, I mean, to 
just a, a general comment is any of those um, kind of sidebar discussions can instantly be, I'll say dangerous, but it's not, you know, there may not be a danger or so, but it could, it, it poses some risk. Yeah. Um, I hate him. So it's, you, you just, you want to be careful in those, you know, little sidebar discussions and agreements that you have because they are the word of mouth pieces that are very difficult to track, right. prove, et cetera. Um, so, you know, to minimize that is, is, is ideal and it's hard to do, but you know, if you've got that kind of banging around in the back of your brain, um, you know, it will help you out a little bit when those things happen. Like, you know, this is discussed. All right, let me, you know, just let me think about it. I'll, uh, you know, we'll think about it. We'll go over it tonight. I'll shoot you an email. Right. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your request for proposal. Right. I'll, I'll get back to you in writing. Right. Right. So we can so, track this, you know, so, some, something like that's fine. Um, you know, what to look for in a builder. Um, you know, history is always great. Um, that's a great place to start. I mean, just like, you know, when in, in, in the hire of anyone in any, in any field, um, you know, what, what standard resume references, mm. like, why, why is that standard? Just cause it, you know, that gives, the, it gives a history, like some history, um, you know, references might be skewed, but you know, you can do your own research too. And especially when you're not necessarily dealing with a, you know, hiring a single person for, you know, a specialized, um, employment opportunity, but you know, it's a contractor, there's, you know, public records out there. So, you know, to do that due diligence is incredibly important in, in our field, in our, in, in the process of, you know, retaining a, a builder or a sub, you know, however you're planning to manage your, your project. Um, you know, and, and it's hard for the, the kind of the starters that are coming up because some are very good. Um, you know, they may have worked for someone for quite a while. Now we're branching out on their own mm -hmm. and they're awesome. Um, and they just don't have that kind of documented history for, you know, to prove their, their worth. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's, there's chances that, that are taken. Um, and often, you know, that's done with the, um, you know, with the, with the benefit of kind of understanding the character as much as you can from the short interactions. And, you know, if there's certain not even red flags, but certain, you know, yellow, orange flags that are popping up, like, you know, and they're, they're untraceable. They, these are, these are new, new companies, new people. Like, you know, you may just want to err on the side of caution. Hmm. Yeah. I think, I think I'm realizing if for the, for the person looking to hire their own contractor, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're getting a low bid, like someone who's cost effective, they better be young. Cause if they're old yeah. and cost effective, they probably got a track history of not being successful. Right. Yep. Which is a really sad realization, yep. but it's probably going to protect you pretty well. Yep. Yep. And it's, yeah, it's fairly, it's fairly accurate. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause this contractor, uh, when he came and interviewed, he told all these stories about how I think his father or grandfather was a builder and the guy, he would, his father and grandfather would just immediately fire anyone who wasn't up to snuff. Like he told all these stories that were mm -hmm. untraceable mm -hmm. for like, I'm the best, right. I will be the best ever. Yep. And yet he's bidding on really a low ball bid for a very small project that most people wouldn't waste their time right. on. Yeah. And yeah, that, and I mean, we got the barn built and it's, you know, but you, you look at it and you look at the house and you can definitely tell it wasn't the same contractor. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, that's a, that's hard. It, it's a thing, but, um, it is. so to round this conversation out with something light, uh, what's your favorite architectural toy? Um, it would, it would still, and has always been, uh, Legos. I, nah. <laughs> I am a, a massive fan. I have definitely, push them upon my children, but thankfully <laughs> it's been well received. Um, you know, usually when the holidays roll around my birthday and, 
I get asked, you know, what do you want? I'll, I'll usually, it will be the request for some sort of, you know, Lego toy. Really? Um, <laughs> something to build, uh, you know, put somewhere and then now, give away. Do you keep them assembled? Uh, some I do, but j usually it's the ones that are like the smallest of the, of the things. Um, I had a, I had a Lego set from the late eighties. That was, it was like the, the flagship spaceship at the time. I it's, think, um, was it detachable and it had two blue things up front and it, like a little space compartment in the back and it had a it? cart it had like a little Rover that came out of the compartment yep. in the back, like the whole back lifted up. Yep. Um, it was like amazing. Uh, and I think I had the same one. My parents kept, they actually kept, um, I had a whole star Wars collection and like oh, yeah. he man, they kept all that. Thankfully, um, they kept all my Legos as well. And they've since been distributed to, um, you know, my, uh, nephews, my children, um, which is awesome. Uh, so we have these, we have these, you know, eighties space guy, Legos um, <laughs> that we build with. And I put together what from what I could mentally recall is that little rover piece, the little like moon rover that they drove out of the back of that spaceship. Um, right. I put that together. I, don't know, I was like last year. And so like, I've got that in my office. Um, but like, yeah, you know, very little kind of stay together. Um, you know, occasionally the new sets will stay together for a little bit. Um, you know, Star Wars Legos are always fun to get these days and put those together. We Luke, got my Luke sand speeder. That one's in my right. office right now. Fantastic. We got my son like the Porsche that was like that size. He wanted it for his birthday. Yep. So we got him, you know, and he put it all together. It stayed together for a little while. But then he started getting into to modifying his RC cars and really like modifying. Oh, them. yeah, cool. Yeah. And he figured out how to power it not like high performance, right. but he could make it drive and steer it with his RC stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, it was pretty cool. He that used the differential cool. and everything. Yeah. And now he's now he's graduated from that to, let's see, he makes his own airplanes out of foam core board. Yep. And then puts the electronics in them and flies them, yep. destroys them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then like just chops off the part that's broken, makes and glues the new right. one in, flies oh, so cool. again. It's so fun. Yeah, that's amazing. Um. And now he, like in the last couple of weeks, he just graduated to modifying like his old little bikes to accept like weed eater engines. Yeah. All right. And is like, nice. now he's got me like welding in the garage with him. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Showing him how to weld. Now he's like using the little uh, centrifugal clutch and everything to yep. power the thing. Oh, that's so great. I'm just like, geez, dude, you're going to. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I keep telling him like, yeah, I just pretty much did Legos when I was your age. So <laughs> right, right. How, cool. how old is he now? He's turning 14 yep. here soon. Excellent. So, yeah. It's, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, 14 and 11. But the younger one does not show any interest in engineering or building type of stuff as much. He loves going out and photographing nature um, and then really like physical activity, adventure yep. type stuff. Yep. It's just present in his body in that way. Oh, so very cool. Kids are, kids are great for understanding life more really yeah i think really putting you through the ringer to yes. realize like oh this is what's valuable and that's not what's that's valuable. right <laughs> yeah that's right and i can yep. live without that like, it turns keep, out keep the perspective going yep right <laughs> yeah absolutely it's wonderful well cool ryan thanks so much for uh coming down and and sharing what what you got going on between here and new york city do you actually end up out on the facade of buildings rappelling down and inspecting yeah, them absolutely uh, I got to hang off. I got to hang off a building tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's fine and great until it's a very windy day. Ooh. Then it's scary. Um, Jeez. But yeah, it's like it's, what are you inspecting out on the outside of a building at that point? So the building envelope itself. Um, yep. So I, I'm a I'm a uh, I'm like a New York City certified wall inspector, and down in New York with all the tall buildings that they have. They have a program and Boston actually has a similar program that every five years, um, buildings over a certain height need to submit essentially inspection reports of their facades. And they have to pay someone like you to go over the whole thing. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, so you have to, you have to take a, um, 
a certain sampling of the facade areas. Okay. So you may not, you don't have to like, like go up and down inch. every, right. Every okay. vertical foot. Um, but you know, every, a, for New York, it's every 60 feet of frontage on a public way. You need to do a, a grade to roof inspection. Um, and then you need to inspect everything, um, you know, from grade using telephoto lenses and blah, blah, blah. But, mm. um, but you have to get up there every, every 60 feet. So if you have a building, you know, that wraps a corner 180 feet long, you know, you got to do three scaffold drops there and then inspect the rest of the building, you know, from using, we use like kind of a high zoom camera, um, right. that, that actually helps us the most for the uh, physical out close. there. Do you use like the window cleaning mechanisms? Yeah. Thing? So it's, yeah. um, the suspended scaffold rig is typically the most common. Um, and it's what I prefer because usually you have the contractor, you, you know, two contractors driving. Mm -hmm. So you're just riding and inspecting, which is, which is easy. Um, you know, the problem is, is when it's a tight area and there can only be two people on the rig, then you have to drive. So like I have a, I have a license to drive a <laughs> scaffold. Um, so like you got to operate the scaffold and inspect and it just, that's a little bit more nerve wracking. Um, any scary stories to share from that? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, give me your best. So <laughs> I was scared on, of heights, by so the way. So I was on a building that's right on, um, the East river, which is where FDR drive, yep. um, is on the East side of Manhattan. Um, uh, 30, how many stories is it? 37 stories. Um, and certain facades are definitely windier than, than others. And I, I knew I had to do the windy side. Um, and so just simply by the direction they're facing, by the direction okay. it's facing. That's correct. And, uh, so how, so th basically the wind can take a scaffold and blow it away from the building. I've seen video. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's, there's, you know, things done to prevent this every, you know, whatever it is, two stories, um, on these, these buildings that have been designed in the more modern day, they will have attachments for those cables that keep it close to the building. So that doesn't really happen as much. Um, sometimes those attachments aren't there. Sometimes the building's older. Um, this had no attachments. Um, so the gust of wind blew, blew us out away from the building, um, turned the rig almost 90 degrees. Oh. Uh, and we came back where the end of the scaffold hit, thankfully, because it was a mostly glass facade, but it had, um, it had bands of masonry. It hit the masonry <laughs> Because if it hit the glass facade, it would have gone through, hit the masonry, which, you know, is a massive impact and then turned back around. But it was still so windy that when we were coming back around, I was thinking we were going to slam against the whole facade with this swing. Um, but the wind actually like caught us and slowed the the return back right. to being flat. Uh but like, I mean, stuff was, was everywhere. Like I was on like one knee, you know, you're holding on to part of the scaffold and are you you're tied holding on to your harness. only the scaffolding or do you have a, so like you have, if a scaffolding you have gives safe, way? You have safety lines that run down that are secured to, you know, somewhere on the roof, which Hope, you should usually you don't need go <laughs> check out before you attach yourself to said safety line. And then you're wearing, you know, kind of a full harness OSHA, that goes over your shoulders. Yep. Thing. Um, and attach to a special, you know, clamp that attaches to that safety line um, that allows you to go up and down. And in the event of a fall, will stop you from plummeting to the earth. So that uh, scaffolding could give way, and you. So that scaffolding huh. could give way, and you would fall a little bit, but you wouldn't fall right. that distance of the scaffold. Um, the scaffold typically has just two cables that keep it up. Um, so you, you've probably seen in the news that like one of those cables had broken and the scaffold, you know, gets upended. Yeah. Um, but the guys are just left dangling. Um, Do, you know. Now you have the ability to like climb that rope back up with like a system or you, you, you do the type of clamp that it is, it's cammed. So you could do that if needed. It is very difficult because it's not, you don't have like the climbing ascension gear where you can move your feet up right. and you have like, you know, straps for your feet, like, like right. climbers do. Um, it's not, 
you don't have that. So it's all kind of in that one cam. Oh, it's geez. basically just designed to hold you there till you can be rescued. Ugh. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Keep, keeps it exciting though. Jeez, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, whenever we're driving over like tall bridge for some, it's not like specifically a fear of heights other than I know this, this thing, if it were to stop existing, I would die. Yeah. You know? yeah. But like, driving over a tall bridge like is is a fear that i can't rationally get rid of <laughs> right, right it's just one of those things yeah. it's just like all right here we go and i'm gonna all right and we're done all right yeah but yeah to do something like that would just probably mm, not yeah good. it's definitely not for everyone um yeah it is not for everyone <laughs> we've we've had a few people you know come and work in our office and have you know tested their want or need and you know the you know, ask them obviously beforehand are you afraid of heights and you know some will say no some will say yes um and once i say no you know you get them on there and uh you know some will do fine and some will not and it's very evident and you know that's not that's not for them and that's okay i would i would have that's to say okay. if i if i was facing another day sitting at a desk i'd probably choose hanging off the side of a building yeah yeah and i'd just have to get over it so yeah yep. it's good <laughs> that it does it does break up the desk time which is nice cool well ryan Scipione of m m a m j m plus a architect thanks for coming down to bitterford i hope you're safe tomorrow on on the side of some building in manhattan yes. all right well Hopefully it's not windy and best of luck. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right.